so usually people would just kind of loosely define this as synergy. Well, I guess that's why uh, a lot of people, in particular with our headphones, like to go with the, the America approach. thing that I've seen countless times over the years, and I'm talking, I've been doing this for 37 years now. Mm -hmm. 37 years. Okay. I started with Bowers and Wilkins in 1985. Mm. Been in the industry a long time. I've seen countless times. People don't understand the way amplifiers, we'll start with amplifiers, but the way the system, but let's say amplifiers, interact with the speakers or the load that's presented to them. And, um, you know, amplifiers can be a variable, a huge variable. And they can sound like one way on one speaker or headphone. They can sound another way on another speaker or headphone. And so let's, we're going to see if we could try to, like, in layman's terms, explain this interaction and why, or why it occurs and, you know, things like that. Uh, yeah. So usually people would just kind of loosely define this as synergy, which isn't easy enough a way to put it, but it's not like a number and you could say, oh, this number matches well with the other number. And that's the issue with the amplifier mating to a headphone. It, um, it is kind of difficult to estimate how it'll perform because um, it depends quite a bit on the design of the amplifier. Because um, you could look at an amplifier and you can't really tell outwardly how it's designed internally what kind of circuit topology it has. Maybe you know if it's tube or solid state, but if it has tubes, it doesn't even mean it's tube output. You don't know how the tubes are necessarily being used. Usually if they're big tubes. Yeah, well, <laughs> maybe, but it's, it's no guarantee, yeah, right? It, you never know. It gives you better odds. Yeah. Um, and solid state, of course, there's a handful of commonly used different design methodologies, topologies, and whatnot. And even beyond that, people frequently use different devices in different ways. They... Uh, intentionally do wonky, weird things sometimes with solid state. It could be to tailor to their specific product. Like sometimes you see manufacturers that make an amplifier exclusively for, for their headphone. And maybe whatever they did in an amp does benefit their headphone. But people assume that since it makes this headphone sound like magic, it's a good amplifier. And that may not always be the case. Oh, I, I kind of see it. I was just thinking about this. Is it like an automotive? It's always automotive references, but you know, okay. uh, people see amplifiers kind of like in a, in a vehicle as like uh, the horsepower rating, right? Yeah. And so all you're looking at is a peak. Now, all anybody talks is peak. Right. This car has 700 horsepower, right? Mm -hmm. But it, most of the time it doesn't, obviously. It's all about that power under the curve and all that. Yeah. So amplifiers are kind of the same thing. And where that peak is varies depending on a lot of things, right? Right. And just because, you know, some amps, higher impedance, they know that. More power or less power just depends, but that's why you can't just like spec one number out. Yeah, there's no torque specification yeah, well, on an amplifier. Well, so even beyond, you don't know that, where the, the curves intersect. Yeah, yeah. Or, you know where. You got to see the data. You got to see the curve. The torque and is kind of like current. I, I would consider like torque would probably be like the size of the power supply. Mm. You know where it actually could put out physical constant current into a low impedance load. Where if you have a more demanding headphone, is the easiest way to explain it. Even though it's not, it's not fully encompassing but more demanding headphones tend to need more current which means the amp needs a bigger power supply so you might have that peak horsepower mm -hmm. you know we're at 10,000 rpm but everywhere else it's useless right. you know and, and so and you're not listening at 10,000 rpm you're shifting <laughs> you know well mm -hmm. usually you shift well, you're only there that. for a little amount yeah, you, be, you better hope you shift before that yeah yeah, yeah. 99 yeah. 99 stuff starts blowing up yeah but yeah you're only you're only at those peaks for short periods so yeah, it's not really a good way to look at it, really. Yeah, and it's a combination of things like those peaks. You know, that, that those peaks matter. It de I mean, especially if you're running in the clipping. Let's say you're taking the amp, and at times it, it isn't powerful enough for what you're driving, whether it be a speaker. I know, like, a lot of the, a lot of the, a lot of the speakers that we see that we've used in the past tend to be a bigger full-size speakers, like 90 dB efficient. You know, and usually, and you play this speaker like that, like in a hotel setting, like we do at shows, on a 100-watt amp, it's not loud enough. Yeah. It's, you would think 100 watts with a pair of speakers in a small hotel room would blow the doors off. 
and we've clipped those 100 watt amps numerous times, mm -hmm. you know, and it's just because of a number of factors. And you, would, you wouldn't think that would occur. And the same thing occurs with headphones, you know, and, and I mean, every amp clips differently, sounds different when it hits that, you know. So well, yeah. you got a lot of variables there that, so you got to be careful when you're mixing and matching things. You know, you got to be aware of it is what you got to be. And it, like you said, it's synergy. Well, I think the biggest thing people, for whatever reason, seem to take for granted or ignore is how much power you really need. Because um, you kind of have two sides of this. There's the more is better. I want as much as I could get. I need 100 watts, people. And there's also the folks that they look at the math. They say, oh, well, here's the sensitivity of the headphone. Here's the volume I listen at. That means this is the power I need. Both are a little misleading. <laughs> Generally speaking, you want more power than you actually truly need to have a little extra overhead, but it is also very difficult to understand how much you're actually loading the device. It's very hard to know at this moment what's the absolute peak that this device will see, since especially on solid state, if they clip, a lot of times it's readily apparent. Yeah, and that thing is, you know, the only way to really know that is to have an oscilloscope, and most people don't own one of those. Yeah. And, and even if they did, well, you know, they're not... Too bad they don't make, like, a cheap oscilloscope that you could plug into one of your RC outputs and just, like, Ooh. watch things. Maybe someone should come up with that. How hard could it be, right? Well, there's pretty cost-effective yeah, scopes out that are like fast that. enough for audio use. Yeah. But you still have to understand how to use it. Well, that's mm. true, yeah. Right. I had I had got one to set up my turntable. You guys got me one for mm -hmm. my birthday or whatever, Christmas. Christmas. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so I, I, I was using it to set up my turntable, and, yeah, it, you, you got your typical scope probes, and I'm clipping to a balanced pin on a connector on the end of a connector trying to clip uh -huh. it. You would think I would make an adapter, but that's too much like work. Mm. So I'm trying to put these connectors from the cable coming out of the, you know what I mean, just to sit the scope probe just right well, so I can watch yeah. left, right, and align the cartridge to get balance and symmetry on both channels and all that stuff. But anyway, that's the more difficult way to do it, you know. Mm. Dr. Fikert came up with a better way, and he just do software that's on a laptop. And yeah. You plug in, and there it is. Oh, yeah. See, so, you know, that's the way to go. There are solutions like that where you can load software, I believe. You know, yeah. you just need an adapter box that goes from, like, USB to some analog converter. Right. The software-driven you know? scopes are usually kind of sluggish, but yeah. they work. It'll give you an idea, and yeah. maybe it's enough to capture a peak or, uh, I don't know, it might not. For audio, yes, yeah. most likely. So, I mean, there are solutions to that if you really want to know what's going on with your system. But for most people, I think it's it's going to be a, a little bit beyond. Over, yeah, a little bit over the top for, for that. But, you know, but, but that's where we have ears. Mm -hmm. You're going to listen to this. And then how hard of a load is the actual speaker? And a lot of loads vary with frequency. Like headphones, like planers aren't yeah. like that, but dynamics can be like that. Yeah. And with speakers, you can go from 2 ohms to 16 ohms, depending on what frequency well, you're Well, that's why they, they put specs usually, out, like ones that have wild swings, they put like 2 ohm minimum, like 8 ohm nominal or something like that on. Because yeah. they're like, they can be 2 ohm sometimes. You know? And then when speakers dip really low, that's when they're drawing a ton of current from the amp. And if the amp choke, if the amp doesn't have the prop, a big enough power supply, it sounds like an amp running out of steam. And so you run into limitations with the bottom end typically, which is bass drivers are what usually draw most of the juice. Yeah, I know like the, the most common problem you have that with is like receivers and stuff, you know. The, they hit like a point where they just go into protection if you, you know, yeah. trying to draw too much from them. Yeah, they're rated with yeah. this high, yeah, right. high power rating, but they don't have a big massive power Well, the supply. problem is that number, that peak number they show you is only one channel driven. And, <laughs> you know, so well, that's never happening. Not seven. Right. Yeah, right. <laughs> so. Well, the unfortunate reality is, generally speaking, power at this point is kind of a marketing term. It's loosely defined and may, it may actually be an actual number. But how it's rated oftentimes can be misleading very easily. They either rate it at one particular frequency or a particular set of circumstances or for very short duration that isn't really realistic. And so people see this number and they expect, oh, this amplifier is 50 watts. That's way more than I need. Well, but only, it could clip. Not only that, I noticed that people tend to choose the biggest number they see. Yeah. Like yeah. Go, and bigger on, is better. On both sides of the equation. Oh, yeah. You know, so they might not realize that, okay, well, this is a six watt amp. Right, mm -hmm. but at what impedance? Like, what load are you presenting to it where it gives you that much power? And that's important, you know, because if it's a six watt amp at 100 ohms, but it's only two watts at at 20 ohms or 30 ohms, then what is it? What is it? And then when you change the headphone on that amp to a different headphone, the amp's going to act differently. It's going to sound different. It's not a it's not a reference. It's not flat. It's not the same. It doesn't act the same with every headphone or speaker. Mm -hmm. So. You know, so at that point, well, what is it? <laughs> how, how much power is it really doing for you? And, you know, and, and is, it, is it accomplishing the task that you're 
that you bought it for or you're using it for. We've seen that plenty of times. Somebody says, well, I know it's not the amp that's running out of power because it has 8 watts. And yeah. then you look into it, it has 8 watts at 32 ohms or 18 ohms or some nominal some number impedance. that they rate it at that's unrealistic. And maybe there's headphones that are that impedance, but you need to understand, oftentimes, if it's rated at 25 ohms or something, at 50 ohms, it's typically half that power. Well, tube amps vary, too, a lot. You could have a rating on a tube amp at, you know, 100 ohms or something. But then as you go down in impedance, that power drops. Yeah. So, so it could be, let's you know, the tube amp puts out up to, let's say, let's make up a number, 2 watts mm -hmm. into 100 ohms. Now you put a 32-ohm headphone on it, and it's doing a quarter watt. Where did all the power go? It was mm -hmm. rated for 2. Well, add on tube amps, sometimes they got multiple taps, you know, 4 ohm, 8 ohm. That's, that adds another bit of complexity to it. Yeah. You so, always have to look at the specifications. So to, to be clear, the same amp, two different headphones, completely different specs. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's bottom line. That's the layman's way of explaining it. And, I mean, it, it, it blows your mind to think about it. Like, I bought this amp because it had this power, but it's not doesn't, doesn't sound right well. Yeah, because it's not, it doesn't have that power into your headphone or your speaker. You know? It's quite variable. It's and, tough. of course, in addition to this, some headphones benefit from more power than more than others. Some headphones aren't that bothered by being slightly underdriven, comparatively. Some headphones don't need or respond as positively to a better dampening factor for an amplifier that has a lower output impedance. Other headphones, more or less particularly uh, planar magnetic designs, really do typically benefit from low output impedance amplifiers. And this is a number that oftentimes is either not particularly accurately represented or not quoted at all in some designs. And for whatever reason, it isn't seemingly like a popular thing for people to look at when they're purchasing. You know, the fire. output impedance of the amp, you yeah. know, or even damping factor, which is even trickier to understand. Right. You know? Because really what matters isn't the output impedance of the amp. That's irrelevant in the grand scheme of things. What matters is the output impedance of the amp relative to the impedance of your headphone. Yeah, you want it to be a lot lower than the headphone appearance. Right. <laughs> Typically, that's, better be a that's lot almost lower. always the best option. We're talking many times lower. You yeah. know? So if you have 300 ohm, 600 ohm headphones, you don't need to be too concerned about the output piece of the app. And that's actually a, one of the biggest reasons why headphones like that exist. Although we've seen like Sennheiser had that amp that they made for their, I think one of their head, for their headphones, yeah. right? Yeah, and it was, it was high output. Right? Yeah, it had a high, like a Very high 200 impedance. ohm output impedance. Yeah. It was apparently made to adjust the sound of the headphone, obviously, because mm -hmm. when you have that kind of output opinions, it's, it's only made for specific devices. And then we had people who go into the planar realm and plug it in thinking they got it. It wasn't, it wasn't a cheap right. amp. And they're plugging in going, well, how come this sounds so thin? Yeah. It's like, well, it's, it can't do it. It was made for a specific headphone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you know, it's tricky. It's, this stuff is tricky. The interaction that occurs between systems and headphone is very complicated. And mm. so you tend to be better off working with products that are known givens with what you're trying to do you know what i mean people well yeah people Someone that have already, already tried it, yeah. you know so many people are using it with that product that you kind of know it's 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 a simple solution dealers are always good with that they they've weeded out you know your typical two channel stereo dealer you hope yeah. you, well you hope you yeah hope if they've been around long enough yeah. they you know they know what sells and what works with what you know and they weeded out the the bad apples so to speak you know or they know how to combine things so that, you know, I mean, no, no speaker is perfect. No headphone is perfect. Sometimes you're looking for some tone control sort of gear for Oh, know, yeah. For That's not stuff. necessarily a fault. There's legitimate reasons why you'd want that. Well, and tube, amp, tube amps exist, right? Yeah. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> yeah. The specifications a lot of time on tube amps aren't vastly superior. Yeah, the distortion higher now. people like. really like the way they sound. And mm -hmm. so if the end result is good sound, pff, what's the difference how you get there? Right. Yeah, so it's it's a tricky it's a tricky road to navigate, and um, you know. But like I said from the from the on from the beginning of the video, I've seen this countless times where people don't understand the interaction. They don't understand it, and you know, and it, it's understandable. I don't understand it. It's confusing. Very complicated. As hell, you know, and it's hard to explain. So anyway, you know, there's 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 pitfalls to audio, and it's mm. that's one of the things you know that. You got to be careful of as you want to try to match up the gear with the, the system with the with the speaker or the headphone as best as possible, and that's kind of the goal, mm -hmm. right? If you're de like us, we're developing, you know, we're we're like cutting edge. If you ask me for what we're doing with sound, you know what I mean? We're like, 
you know, we're not we're not after making softer sounding products. We're not trying to hide, you know, or, or what do we call it? Cover we're not or hiding mask. faults. Yeah. yeah. So I guess that is a fair point because that doesn't necessarily mean that our approach is better or something like that. No, not at all. It, what we're trying to get across is what we do is, I think, quite different than what other companies do. We push the envelope. We're trying mm-hmm. to make a total package that performs better than anything else. And our headphone being part of that equation, we're assuming you're pairing this headphone with sensible gear. And typically, if you're buying an expensive headphone, you're not going to pair it to like an iPhone dongle or something like that. Not to say you couldn't, but obviously that wouldn't be the expectation when you're making a $5,000 headphone. Mm -hmm. So we kind of more or less find gear that would work well for this, and then we tune it with and around that sort of gear. And that does have disadvantages for sure. Because if you have uh, designs that are a little quirky, like some of these designs that were made specifically for a specific headphone, um, headphones like ours typically will not perform well at all on those. Um, and so that's why you do see people A lot of headphones won't perform well on that. <laughs> except, right. Except right. for the but targeted. But it's, it's more exaggerated mm-hmm. in certain spaces. Right. And that's, it is why you see people claiming things like our headphones are more amp sensitive. Yeah, because as the headphone in, a, in a, an amp with a really high output impedance, it just it can't drive any power current, really. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, as soon as you put a lower impedance headphone, even 50 ohms, 32 ohms, even 16, I mean, the amp's just dying. It's choking. It can't supply the power. And so, you know, that's what it sounds like. It's well, I guess that's why uh, a lot of people, in particular with our headphones, like to go with the, the America approach and just throw way, <laughs> not, not like a lot of power. V8 engine? Just yeah, way too sometimes much power. They go a I mean, that solves but problems, yeah, right? Yeah. But you don't need to worry about it. Well, because, yeah, at that point, you've got them. You know you got a big power right, supply. Right. The thing probably weighs 50 pounds, right? Mm. You got the power supply covered. Even if you don't play it at full volume, which you won't because yeah. you'll go deaf. Yeah. But even if you don't, right? You know, that's probably the, the why you'll see some people loving the run speaker amps speaker with, apps, yeah. with adapters, you know? You don't run out of you power. Know? I mean, those amps are heavy. They got big yeah. power supplies. They're made to run four ohm loads. So the, they have to put be able to put out all kinds of current. So to, to a speaker amp, a headphone's like a breeze. Yeah. <laughs> it's nothing. But you know? we should state, of course, especially to a novice, a speaker amplifier on a headphone has pitfalls, challenges, and it's not recommended unless you really know what you're doing and you assume the risks because it's comparatively very easy to blow up your headphone. Yeah, I think we covered this in one of our older videos. Yeah. We probably should rehash that again. Yeah. Uh, in well, I mean, it's kind of the same problem, but just from a different angle because, like, the the amp like speaker amp designers aren't intending to run like it seventy be, eighty it's be unplugging that, headphones that too, into it, but yeah. they're not. They're usually designed for like eight ohm speakers. Yeah. But now that you're putting like you know eighty ohm headphones into right. it, and could be an issue. They could flake out. So, I yeah. mean, most are fine, but it's not. Yeah, they're, they're not true. made for being connected and disconnecting the load all the time and yeah. stuff like that. Yeah. They're made for your the, the manufacturer designer of a speaker amp is assuming that you have a pair of speakers with speaker wire hooked up all the time, but right. you're not changing them yeah, there shouldn't while be the any amp's sitting there on. Yeah. Right. You and know? that is a fair point, because I've seen people bring up quite a few times that, why well, have a right hand? I could adjust the volume knob. I'm not a dummy. I know I just don't turn the volume too high, but it goes beyond that. Some amplifier designs could be unstable if the load disappears. So if your connections get removed, if you unplug your headphones or something happens to any of the connections online, it's possible that the headphone, the amplifier doesn't have enough of a load on it to be stable and it could actually put out way more power than you intend. It could send out a lot of voltage and blow up a headphone. Yeah, and that's the problem with having way too much power. I mean, it's fun, it's mm. nice. I know I run 500 watt mono blocks on my two channels. Definitely don't need it. You know, and I've, <laughs> I've not blown up a woofer yet. <laughs> right. But I remember one, one, of, one, of, one, of the, one of our guys here did that was mm-hmm. years ago. Mm-hmm. He, was, he, he was in, when none of us were in, he was playing those speakers. Exuberantly, yes, yes, and boy, they sounded good right to the point where it stopped playing. Well, see, there, there, there was a different problem. It was a visual problem he ran into because there was two pairs of speakers there, uh-huh. a bigger one and uh-huh. your little speakers. So we thought it was the big ones. Yeah, it's like yeah, they could take it, but he was pushing them. Yeah, those little driver, seven-inch drivers, so much. Yeah, and, that, and that's the issue, you know, with headphones too. It's the same kind of think thought process where you got to know the limitations of the driver. Some people don't understand it at some point. That tiny little speaker is going to give up the ghost if you put too much juice in it. It can't do. It can't deal with it. Yeah. And it could sound clean all the way to the point. It might not distort. It might play 130 dB, right? 
deafening levels was sounding pretty good mm. all the way to the point where it stops playing. Open like a fuse. Right? Yeah. It's Eek. a trade-off because mm -hmm. you want to have enough power so you never experience clipping, but there's no advantage to having way too much power. What you care about is the output impedance and having enough power. <laughs> Typically, people overshoot it and just go like right to the moon with it and put a 100-watt monobuck on it. That's fine and all, but you do run a risk. Remember, we mentioned this years ago, but remember when we, used to, when we first started in this biz, we were working with, uh, in the headphone side of things, yeah. we first started working with Alex Cavelli, mm -hmm. and he always had some doozies, some sayings, you know, because he was, he was hardcore physicist, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. and, and, and engineering was more or less his hobby, and, but he was a hardcore, you know, he, was, he, he made things to work mm -hmm. forever, you know, he was like a Swiss clock he maker thought in some through respects. It. Yeah, you know, which could yeah. be maddening. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but, but anyway, remember that one time he's like, he says, Joe, you know how hard it is to make an amplifier that'll run a load from 16 ohms to 300 ohms? Mm -hmm. and I'm like, no, Alex, tell me how hard it is. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you know, and I mean, obviously, that's, that's the deal. That's what you're looking at, right? Because you're dealing with such a variable with headphones. It's yeah. crazy. I mean, speakers are pretty common. You know, they know that if they go too low, Amps won't even be able to run. You'll blow mm -hmm. fuses. And if they go too high, well, you yeah. know, they don't because they can't be efficient. So bottom line is that speakers usually run in a range, but headphones, yeah, they're freaking all over the place. You know, I've seen, what, the, the, the in-ears run 16 and under, right? I've seen yeah, some, like, some are yeah, super eight, low. Yeah. yeah, what the hell are you plugging that into? That's a low impedance, mm -hmm. you know? I bet you a lot of these amplifier designers would cringe if you told them what you were running. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. If you said, "Oh, I'm running 600 ohm on this," I'm running well, a that's eight the other ohm. thing. And then you got the other. Uh, everything's got multiple connections on it now, so you can plug in multiple headphones, and that that's why a lot of amps don't say don't plug in more than one at the same time. Yeah, right. Because then you add a whole right. other. Most aren't made for it. Yeah. Then you got two variable loads in there. So yeah. yeah, and you're dropping the impedance in half usually yeah. with the two of them. And you have one volume knob for two different devices, yeah. so it's kind of challenging because <laughs> if the sensitivity issue. and impedance is totally off you could have a real problem there. Yeah, and that's the other factor too when you think about it, like with sensitivity, like higher sensitivity headphones, right? You're barely cracking the volume on a bigger amp, mm -hmm. right? It may sound great and you got all kinds of power reserve, but noise becomes an issue now. You oh, got yeah. a bigger amp, but now bigger amps usually are a little noisier. Yeah. So you got a high efficiency that doesn't take much power to hear. So the noise doesn't take much power to hear. You don't. You hear the noise easier on a high efficiency. Yeah, the noise floor becomes a big issue. Yeah. So I mean, there's trade-offs to all this stuff. So it's tough. You know, we're you know, like ours are our headphones are different. They're low efficiency, mm -hmm. 90 dB, 89 dB. So solves the noise issue. Yeah, you have. Yeah, you don't hear the noise for most amps with our stuff. It just not. But you need power. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, but you need power to bring the audio level up to a point where you. But not do too hear. much. Yeah. But not too much. And then of course, inevitably beyond that, manufacturers can be optimistic in their power ratings. And it's understandable because consumers, a lot of times, they look for the bigger power number. If you tell a consumer that this amp is a high price and it has half a watt, a lot of times they go, oh, that doesn't sound like enough, at least if you're driving a demanding load. Mm -hmm. But you tell them it has two watts, it might actually have half. You tell them it's two watts, they get all excited, they'll start buying it. And we've seen a bunch of manufacturers do this. Yeah. Well, you not know. only the manufacturers, the dealers... The ratings. They I mean, you, the numbers. Usually, when you know, you look at something like even just if you're ordering from a website or something, you know, it's not going to give you everything. Well, it doesn't yeah. have all the specs. You right. got bullet points there. You're trying to describe the thing. You're trying to be honest about it, and it's going to show power. And that's it's going to be one number. Mm -hmm. You have no idea yeah. where that number lies. What right. impedance? But what I guess that goes again for like for automobiles. Same problem. They don't. Nobody specs. You know, to shows dyno curves. And nobody they, looks they past the power peak figure. Power. Yeah, that's right. what, that's what yeah. Peak power is almost meaningless. Just like peak power in an amplifier, doesn't mean anything unless it's right into your load. And zero to sixty, zero to hundred yeah. kilometers. Well, that that that's you can't really make that yeah. up. <laughs> yeah, right. You know that that is kind of telling. Yeah, but uh, but in the but end, even then, people now claim that uh, manufacturers have been optimizing so long for zero to sixty times. That's, that's true. true. They do. You look at the difference now between some cars zero to sixty and the quarter mile. Some cars look fast, zero to 60, but it's heavily optimized for that. And then the quarter mile tends to show you it doesn't really have this much power as you think. Yeah, it's, it's just 62 it's, at bogs. Well, that's the thing. The Corvette <laughs> right, pretty much. shifts into eight. Yeah. yeah, Corvette's been doing that for a long time because they, they, they know that, that having a better number is better, obviously. It sells so cars. So what they do is make sure like all new Corvettes hit 60 in first gear so yeah. you don't even need to shift. Yeah, that right. saves a little problem. time to yeah, shift. A bit. Yeah. So that's one way you can do it. But Avoid the whole double cut situation. Yeah, that's, that's <laughs> but it a, makes that's it look vehicle. better than it is. Yeah, right. True. Well, and that's but, the same with electronics. You know, you can't, you really don't know how it's going to sound. 
until you try it. Mm. And then, and then even then, you got to have some sort of multiple reference points. You really got to triangulate on what's good if you don't know. If it's a never, good idea. If you've yeah. never tried it. You've got to triangulate. You got to try. If you got a headphone, you got to try a couple different systems on it, a couple different amps to see what's going on with the headphone and the amps, and vice versa. If you got a couple different, if you got an amp. And you got a couple of different headphones, you're you're probably looking for a headphone that fits the amp, right? But the problem with all that, that whole thing where if you're actually trying to find one matches the other, is that hopefully the decisions made where every the, the the electronics are universal enough where if you change the headphone, it'll still sound good. Mm -hmm. You know, you're not picking an amp or electronics just for that one headphone. Well, you could, but yeah, yeah and but, then what, but that's the thing most people do. Yeah, right. Because it's very common. It's very common, and the two channels the same. Like I said, I've seen it ten thousand times, and I call it a merry-go-round. Everyone's always on the merry-go-round. Well, it's a little different in two channel though, because you probably don't have like just stacks of speakers, <laughs> you know, where you could have a yeah twenty headphones, no yeah. problem. But you could have an amp that you had for 10, 15 years, and yeah. you're going through speakers, and you can't find a new one that you like. You always mm -hmm. like the old one. Why? Mm -hmm. Because the amp was. You pick the amp for that speaker. It ain't working with any other speaker. That's that's the that's the dilemma. Well, you see that also a lot. could be just yeah. you're used to it because <laughs> you've been listening to it for ten. Well, years. Well, that helps too. But I yeah. think it's because you actually did find you yeah. took the time at that well, yeah. point, and so you could rock through ten pairs of speakers, right, with that one amp and not like any of them. And you'll back go back to the old shoe. But it's really the amp that's causing you the mm. issue, not the speakers. Mm -hmm. You know, so you've you've made you've gone skipped through. You've done all that work with speakers, but you're not realizing the interaction was. There was an interaction there to begin with. Why? Because the amp always worked before. Hmm. You know, we talked about this with line conditioners too. I don't want to go into that either. It's the same, but it's the same thing where they bought a line conditioner or something that goes into power line to solve yep. an issue that they had. And then as the system evolves over the years, the issue is gone because you've changed things. Mm -hmm. right? But you still plug into the same black box, mm -hmm. not knowing whether it's helping or hurting. And you always have to second guess these things. It's, we say, we've said it before, and we say it again, you always have to second guess the combination. I think it's more profound than people recognize there because it's it's easy if you buy something that works, it solves your problem, to like it. It's easy to be like, wow, this is a great piece. I really like it. It works wonders. It's a common thing people say. And then time goes on. You change something else out in your system. And maybe what this did is no longer necessary. It actually could be a detriment to your system. But it's hard to reevaluate. It's hard for people to say, well, let me yank this out and see. Do I still like it? Because it could have just been that this was solving this problem, but in most systems, it doesn't actually help, or it could be worse. Yeah. And you see you that really, a lot? Yep. And usually it's someone who comes and says, hey, you know, I don't, something doesn't sound right. Mm -hmm. Can you help me here? And you, you go through the system, and you look at what they're doing, and go, you can usually, a lot of times customers already know. They kind of have a feeling. They have a vague idea of something that's always been bugging them in the mm -hmm. back of their mind, you know yeah. what I mean? And they never really addressed it. And uh, usually if you point to the same thing that they had in their back of their mind, it, it just basically reinforces the fact that, oh, mm -hmm. I, I think I need to deal with that, you know. But, but anyway, bottom line is that, yeah, there's, this can go on. We can go on and on about this. Yeah. this is, the, the, the real ticket is that, you know, if you're trying out something new and, and it, it ain't working for you, you may want to go back to the, the book or somebody who's done this before and say, hey, you know, what am I doing wrong? Is there something I could be doing differently? I think it's something you, anybody, anybody should do. Uh, especially if you haven't got the experience level with all the different gear mm. and how it interacts. It's a lot to know, man. Like I said, I've been doing it 37 years, and I'm still learning. Mm. And I think Paul from PS Audio would say the same thing with his videos. You know, someone asked him that. Yeah, you actually. You don't stop. Mm -hmm. There's no, you don't stop learning. He's, he just said how old he was. I forgot what he said, 72 or something. Something like that. Yeah, 70-something. Yeah. The interesting thing is it seems inevitable that people with a great deal of experience – like Paul, they continue to find out how much these things matter, how you never could really settle on something that's perfection. Um, it seems like it's too easy for humans to say, oh, well, this is great. It's perfect. In my last two, three setups, this particular gear worked wonders and it did exactly what I wanted. But it's hard to reevaluate these things continually but you kind of need to do it. Um, yeah, as all the time. things around your system change, as parts change in your system, you need to continue to evaluate, is this cable doing what I thought it did? Does this power regenerator solve the problem I once had? And things like that, and on and on. Because a lot of times you, you swap something out, you think, oh, it can't be this. This sounds great. Right. But you're not checking well, to work, see if that sounds before. great. You're assuming mm. it sounds great, right? <laughs> yeah. You know, five years ago when you 
did this comparison head to head between different amps that sounded great, but is it still as great as you thought it was today? Sometimes it is. Yeah. Sometimes, yeah, that can be a valid output, of course. Well, we're, I think we're all, the three of us are all optimistic and that we always consider things to be progress. We're moving yeah. forward. Mm -hmm. So not necessarily that newer is better, but that as we move forward in this industry that we feel like we are progressing toward a common goal, you know? And um, I, I mean, that's the way we look at it. And so we're, we're not usually looking in the rearview mirror going, oh, what, what'd you use 20 years ago? <laughs> you know? Mm -hmm. But anyway, bottom line is that, um, yeah, you know, it's, it's, it's a lot to think about here. We're talking about a very complex subject. And so the best bet is to refer to people who have done it already or experts in the field and see what they got to say. You don't have to listen to them, but see what they got to say. You might learn a few things from them, you know? There's a lot of people out there who have a ton of knowledge. And unfortunately, a lot of the older guys are dying, getting older. They're not talking as much. You don't hear from them. They're retired. Mm -hmm. They move to warmer climates. They're not online. Yeah. Well, they don't want to chat. They're like, I got my system. It's done. Yeah, I don't care. Right. <laughs> yeah. And unfortunately, so the world's losing that reference point. You know, yeah. you're losing them. You're starting to lose them. It's kind of like craftsmen, you know, people who mm -hmm. used to whittle wood carvings for homes and, dec you know, moldings and stuff that it's a lost art these things are gone for the most part and uh so audio is the same deal we're you know we lost a lot of, we're losing a lot of people over the years and uh so you got the newer generation taking over online and so on and that and there's a lot that they don't know about and uh so hopefully hopefully these videos help mm -hmm. that's the idea is to try to explain to people you know at least give them a glimpse or an idea or a direction or something to consider all mm -hmm. you got to do is consider the variables, mm -hmm. you know? You don't have to act on them. Just consider them. Always consider them. Yeah. It's a continual reevaluation. Could get maddening, though. It could be real maddening. Yeah. <laughs> you know? I, I've learned, I, you got to have a governor. Yeah. You know, you got to have an upper ceiling or a limit, limit for the most part. And that's, you don't want to lose it. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, anyway, people, thank you very much for watching. Take care of yourselves. <laughs>